Okay, everybody's here. I'll call this meeting to order. And um, I'll ask for uh, adoption of the agenda. Are there any additions for the agenda today? See then I'll make a motion. Okay, thank you, James. All in favor? And carry. Um, this is going online, right? Okay, I think we'll do introductions for those watching um, from home. We'll start with Marlene, please. Ernie Gender, member of the board. Three needs, board member. Larry Clark, board member. Wayne Nixon, board member. Uh, Hilberg, board vice chair. And James Haberg, board member. Nikki Thorstenson, communications. Quentin Beaumont, manager of agriculture operations. Andrew Burchick, uh, director of municipal services. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to adoption of the minutes from the June 23rd meeting. Has everyone uh, had a chance to review those? Mr. Clark? Okay, Larry, so moves. All those in favor? And that's carried. Delegations. Um, Jason Turner, at what time was he? Anytime we have them there, they've joined us via Zoom. We have Jason Turner, Paul Gathon, and Marilyn Smith. Oh, okay. So if they're ready, we should probably get them on board with the meeting. Good morning, guys. Can you hear us? Yeah, good morning. Uh, this is Jason. Uh, thanks for having us uh, come and speak with you this morning. Um, we've got uh, Marilyn Smith uh, from AFSC, uh, who's our agri stability coach uh, within uh, one of our agri stability coaches within uh, the corporation. And uh, Holly McLennan, who's the team leader insurance, uh, who's uh, for the area that sits in the Camrose office. And I am the manager of lending United and agri stability products at AFSC. So thanks for having us this morning. Welcome. Um, so I don't know if you want me to go straight into some uh, remarks here, or if, if you were looking to start with questions or. I think you can go ahead and uh, with what presentation you have there. Sure. Um, so I think uh, where I'd like to start this morning with uh, some of my comments is around uh, some of the most uh, pressing needs. As you may have heard uh, announcements, uh, or I'm sure you've heard announcements uh, from the provincial government around support for uh, 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 livestock producers in the province. Um, and um, so by way of updates or information on the agri recovery uh, initiative that's underway, um, the Canada Alberta Livestock Feed Assistance Initiative, or what we're uh, calling CALFA, um, uh, we're underway. Um, the full, ag full agri recovery program details are being finalized at this time still uh, in terms of the terms and conditions that we uh, negotiate with the federal government, who's also a partner in the delivery of that program. Um, the initial payment, so the, the structure of that initiative will be in two parts, has been announced. The initial payment of $94 per head for, uh, uh, per animal as of August 6th uh, will be the initial payment. And then there'll be a secondary payment um, that will be based on extraordinary costs um, associated to feed those animals uh, due to extreme drought and heat. Um, animals other than beef cows uh, have different uh, support levels that will be applied and that will all be outlined in terms and conditions uh, when they're made available. This is for breeding females, uh, breeding female animals are the animals that will be eligible under the program. Uh, we're looking to have online applications when we do go live uh, to accept intake for this program. And we're working on that interface now internally. We anticipate that it's going to be available in early September. Uh, producers who are current AFSC clients should ensure that they have an AFSC Connect account and are signed up for direct deposit to receive program payments. That will be the most expedited way uh, to receive payment under the initiative, is if you apply online and have your direct deposit set up with AFSC, 
and then we'll be able to flow the water uh, directly into the blue circuit. Producers who are not currently AFSC clients will need to sign up for an AFSC Connect account. Directions for that will be available soon. We invite producers to uh, to uh, check our website um, and our social media feeds. We'll be providing updates as we move closer to application intake and the processes that will need to be followed there. Producers can take steps now to ensure a smooth process when they uh, when applications do become available. Prepare an inventory of breeding females on hand as of August 6th. Uh, that's what will be needed uh, to apply for that first initial payment. Uh, keep any records uh, for expenses incurred for drought related costs. Uh, those may be required for the secondary payment application. And again, keep checking uh, AFSC regularly for updates um, and follow us on social media uh, for updates on when uh, that process will be moving forward. Um, on the lending side, um, we are responding with uh, proactively um, those who have our existing AFSC client with loans. Um, if, there, if there are difficulties being experienced, we invite you to contact your relationship manager lending um, and to discuss what your options are for loan, loan deferrals, reamortizations, interest-only payments, etc. There are, there are options available that your relationship manager can discuss with you. Uh, for those who are looking to access funding, uh, perhaps to cover some of these costs that are occurring, again, we invite you to reach out uh, to your nearest AFSC office, uh, to your nearest relationship manager lending, uh, to discuss uh, the availability of uh, a loan for working capital, if that's something that's desired uh, or, or uh, may assist with the situation. Uh, we do have that uh, available uh, for discussion. Um, are there any two, any questions on any of those items? Um, I'll throw it over to Marilyn next, uh, maybe some agri stability points, but I can pause there if there's any questions on that. So, it, okay, yeah, James Nyberg from our board has a question for you. Jason, is it only going to be on breeding females? Yes. What about replacement? Um, if they're if they're bred, only if they're bred. Yeah. But not if they're going to be um, replacements for next year. Yeah. As of as of right now, and again, we're still going through the terms and conditions. But as of right now, yes. Okay. Are there any other questions uh, from this board yet? I have one quick question then. So, so the initial uh, ninety-four dollar uh, support uh, to access that, you don't have to produce uh, receipts or anything that you've purchased something because of the joke. Is that correct? That's correct. The initial payment, and we've held the line on this, will just be based on the inventory of animals on, uh, on hand as of uh, so you're breeding female animals on hand as of August sixth. Uh, August 6th being the date of the announcement from the provincial government. That's why we're, we're using that date as the, as the uh, initial um, inventory date. Um, but it'll basically be, um, you know, by declaration, I had this many animals on hand as at August 6th uh, times the $94. That will trigger the initial payment. Thank you. Uh, looks like there's no further questions. So, yeah, you can continue. Okay. Um, I'll throw it to you, um, Marilyn, uh, for any comments on agri stability. Well, thanks very much, Jason. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to talk about agri stability this morning. Earlier this spring, there was a major change announced for the 2021 and 2022 agri stability program years. In March, the federal, provincial, and territorial ag ministers came to an agreement to remove the reference margin limit retroactive to 2020, and also extended the 2021 deadline for enrollment to June 30th. The removal of the reference margin limit is intended to make agri-stability simpler, more predictable, and more equitable across all agriculture sectors. Participation in this program includes low-cost fees and provides producers with whole farm risk management protection against disasters, and margin declines of 30% or more that threaten farm viability. 
As well, on July 22nd, the governments of Canada and Alberta announced that producers enrolled in acre stability who trigger an interim benefit will receive 75% of the estimated benefit. This increase from 50 to 75% is intended to assist producers with cash flow. Interim applications and a handy reference guide are available under the 2021 Agri Stability Participant link on AFSC.ca. And then one other enhancement I'd like to mention that you might not be aware of is that beginning in 2020, producers are no longer penalized for proactively managing their risk by using private insurance. Payments received from private insurance programs are not included in the current year, but are included in the farm's history, raising the coverage level and potentially increasing agri-stability program response. The premiums for private insurance programs are considered allowable expenses in both the program year and reference years. So this includes programs such as livestock price insurance and AFSC straight hail. So for example, it can work very well to stack livestock price insurance with agri-stability to manage price risk for market cattle and hogs. So that's my update for agri-stability. Is there any questions about what I mentioned today? Any questions from the board? Um, it doesn't appear we have any questions right now, so um, okay. thanks. I'll, tur I'll turn it over to Holly then to talk about insurance. Okay, thanks. Good morning. Hi, Holly. So I have a few points that I'll um, start with and then we can go to the questions. So we recognize that there's uh, dry conditions and hot conditions throughout the province. We are monitoring that with our teams. We have adjusters that we will move throughout. We are um, ranking and, and resolving claims based on um, the priority for those claims that uh, clients or producers who are needing to uh, use their feed to, uh, to um, provide uh, sustenance for their cattle. So they are given priority. So if they have questions or concerns, they can contact their local branch office and discuss that with their RMI. We have the MDI and the MDE uh, moisture deficiency endorsement programs. MDI is the moisture deficiency insurance and it's based for a pro, um, sorry, pasture and it ensures native, improved bush and community pastures where the MDE is an endorsement on your hay. If you have hay coverage, then there's an additional endorsement that will provide a little bit more coverage for the lack of moisture. So these programs reflect how hay and pasture crops are harvested with the MDE following full season as hay is harvested at the end of the growing season and MDI providing season, uh, split season options as pasture is harvested throughout the growing season. Losses paid under the MDI and MDE programs are based on accumulated per precipitation as the weather stations, not on um, actual pasture conditions or production. Coverage does not consider soil moisture reserves that were available, high temperatures that evaporate moisture, winds that dry out the soil and plants or pesticides, or pest invasion, sorry, or hail event. Clients are compensated on the precipitation shortfalls below a prescribed threshold, which is a, a normal of 70% for the split seasons and 80% for the full season. Um, and these percent normals are cal calculated separately for each month, decreasing the impact of single rain events that could have an, um, an uh, impact on the insurable period. So the uh, they do, AFSC recognizes when there's a large amount of precipitation, well, which we've had in the last uh, week or so, that these are, uh, there's two caps that we use. Most precipitation that AFSC will account on a single day is 100% of the monthly normal. And the most precipitation that AFSC will count during a month is 150% of the monthly normal. Uh, the MDAE and MDI indemnity payments are based on precipitation information. Um, from close to 250 weather stations throughout the province. This information is collected in and near real time and is quality controlled by Alberta Agriculture and Forestry Climate Information Service. And when the insurable per period month is over, the daily precipitation data is reviewed for completeness, accuracy, and usefulness. These processes take a little time, so therefore the pay program payments are typically made within one month of the end of the insurance period. Any questions? 
Uh, yes, um, Larry Clark, one of our board members, has a question. Paul, I just want to clarify one statement you made about the high rainfall we had this week. I am east of Statler. I'm not sure where my station, like sitting here, I can't remember where the station is for moisture, but we had uh, a whopping two tenths of that. Oh, you okay. So, so I, I, we've heard, I sat at the table this morning and people were talking an inch and a quarter in certain parts of our county, three tenths. But both the, the vice chair and myself uh, kind of were getting the short end of the stick on the rain. So I was I was a quarter, uh, two tenths to a quarter, and he was really stretching three tenths. So it, see, it wasn't really wide, widespread big rain. So nothing like that. We may not have to use the caps for that particular web station, yeah. but there will be a couple that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and board member Wayne Nixon has a question. Yes, and that's a sort of follow up on the same thing. Uh, that's the complaints I've heard because of uh, <clears throat> this year, the, there's been so much spotty rainfall within a mile or two of uh, where, where somebody might get, you know, a, significant amount and somebody within a mile or two might not get any so that was been a, a complaint that i've heard uh, about that particular program yeah but it is a based it's a weather-based uh, program and we all know that when we play with mother nature she's not uh, fair i mean one side of my farm can receive uh, an inch and the other side only a quarter of it like, exactly yeah so no matter where we put the weather stations it's not going to yep. be the the ultimate thank you for that I guess another anomaly of this year is the, the uh, early part of the year maybe producers did receive normal or near normal rainfall but with an incredible heat wave in June like nobody's ever seen like 38 day after day with the wind I mean nobody's ever seen I don't think a heat that early in the growing season and it, it just totally did uh, crippled the plants and they just didn't produce after that. So, and, and I guess there's the system has no way of dealing with that in the favor of a producer. The rainfall says it should be there and the crop says, no, it's not, but yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. Um, are there any other questions for Holly? Okay, it doesn't look like we have more questions. So did you have anything else to add, Holly? Nope, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your presentation. It's always nice to get more information for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank thanks so much, um, Jason and Marilyn, as well. We appreciate the, the updates. Uh, I'm sure uh, these programs will be well received by the producers who are dealing with the drought this year. And oh. Just one thing, um, the information that you guys have uh, put out there with the contacts, you'll forward that to, or maybe Quentin already has that, and we can get that out um, through our website, et cetera, right? And social media, so that we can get the, like the AFC um, places to go and stuff like that. Yeah, sorry, you're talking for the agro recovery information? Yeah, for all the information today, there was a number of spots that everybody had mentioned that they, you could get the... Uh, more information at here or there. Sure, yeah, most everything we've covered today for the most part, uh, particularly the ag recovery information is posted on our website, but okay. I'll try to get some links uh, sent out to Quinton uh, to clarify that. Um, I'm also working internally because we do have it posted, but I noted the other day that uh, some of that ag recovery, sorry, ag recovery information is maybe not highlighted on our first page in terms of a direct link. So we'll be getting that clarified as well so that it's easier when people get to our homepage uh, to navigate uh, directly to that agri stability, sorry, agri recovery <laughs> information uh, rather than having to search for it. No, that, that's good because a lot of times the first call goes to our um, egg service man now because uh, it was, um, well, as you all know, they've taken out some of the uh, supports that were out there. So. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll thank you. Back. Yeah, thank you. That sounds good. Okay. Well, we thank you for your presentation, Jason, Marilyn, and Holly. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay, now we're back to our meeting portion. Uh, reports. Uh, the uh, 
ASB administration report put in place. All right, so the first round of roadside vegetation control, uh, Fen Road South down to Starland County, Red Deer River to Painters County has been completed. And now we are kind of starting over again, hitting some of the earlier roads, uh, reviewing some of the roads that maybe half a tree was sprayed or maybe not the full patch of weeds. So now we're just kind of picking up stuff that was missed on the first pass as well as um, the brush sites that Public Works has been brushing over the last winter or two. We're still actively hitting those, um, which they got more done than, than I thought they'd get done. So we're, we're getting on it, but we're, we're it's it's ongoing. Um, we'll continue that until trees move on. So we've you know, this moisture is going to help us out, keep things going a little longer, but we've probably got three weeks, four weeks left to brush spraying before we start to see trees starting to go dormant on us. But uh, we'll continue as long as we can. <clears throat> um, weed spray completed Botha Cemetery, Botha Drainage Project, a couple of rate pairs, Gasby Park, Botha Ball Diamond, as well as the Bayview Extension. Um, I guess south of what was Old Bolin, we're, we're creating that, that parkway, that pathway. We've done some spraying in there to keep things open. Uh, Bayview Extension Street. Um, Both well, Ball Diamond, I guess, I have that twice. Must have been important. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the big ones. We're now. Uh, going around to our gravel pits and kind of get some reclamation done on some of those, both the active and the ones that we're reclaiming. Uh, we've done a pile of Richardson ground squirrel control, both the both the ball diamonds and some parkways. And some weed inspections conducted, Erskine, Gadsby, both the Bymore Indian, looking for a prohibited noxious weed, looking for those daisies. And then uh, hybrid seeding was crazy this year. Recently, we picked up the, I call it the Kirtley Road. I'm not really sure if it's got a project code for, for egg services, but the little off of Highway 12. Like John Deere? Yeah, we had to do a 250-meter, 300-meter piece of road, so that's been seeded. Quinn, did you notice with the hydro seeder this year, did you have better uptake because of the fact that it was put down with water or what like, can you give us a little bit of an opinion on that or what your thoughts are bad year to ask that question yeah. in a normal year it's there's better uptake because we're, we're putting a mulch basically it looks like shredded paper but it acts like a wick so when we do get moisture it sucks up i think it's like 130 percent of the water that per weight and then slowly lets the grain, the grass seed take that moisture. So it is supposed to do a better job. In a year like this, I don't really know if it did a better job or not because it's been so dry. Did you have some that you did with the Brilliant Cedar that, that you could compare against? I, I'm just I'm just wondering for recommendations for people next year or in a dry year, would the Hydro Cedar be something that is a is something I mean we do it mostly the, for for terrain and for for um, multiple uses right so I, I guess as far as seeding goes I would suggest the brilliance here because it is a precision drilling unit you're getting down accurate seed placement you're getting um, coverage equal coverage across the field brilliant cedar is the way to go but because of the drain, that's why we're using the hydro seeder. We're using a mulch with it. It's got a tackle fire, so it makes it sticky. It's applying those steep slopes and, and, and helping things stick in place where I can't get my brilliant seeder, right? We're talking about a, a six foot edge on a, on a slope that levels out. I can't seed that with my brilliant seeder because it's too big. So in the past, we've used our quad seeder, broadcast, arrowed it in, called it a day. The hydro seeder is better than that. The hydro seeder doesn't seed as evenly as a brilliant seeder, right? It's essentially, it's a very crude water truck or a fire truck. It's got, it's just a, it's 
got a nozzle like a spray spray truck, but it's it's three inches big, right? Like it's huge, mm -hmm. and it just sprays a fan. So you basically paint it on. And with the mulch, it helps you see where you've gone because it is green, so you can kind of try and get it evenly as possible. But it's for those steep terrain areas that we can't get into very easily. So to compare them, is it really? I just wondered if it was in a dry year with that extra moisture, was a better uptake or not? Well, some of the bridge replacement projects we did last year, those five or six bridge, big bridge replacements we did, um, we are seeing seed come up. Is it going to be? Is it going to be enough to get us through the winter and into spring? Hard to say because it's not getting, it's not getting that root uptake that it should with the moisture we should be getting. I think we'll know better next year. It's a tool we want to keep in the toolbox for sure. Um, I was just wondering if it had more applications. That's fair enough. And um, Ernie has a question, comment. Like I had the same concerns out there, Mitchell, but I find especially when you've got a real dry year like this and you hide your seed, it, it could force that seed to become sprouted. And if there's an any follow up moisture, <coughs> you know, then I can definitely see a okay, where there's going to be application, but this year we did not know. Yeah. And as the year progresses, we say, no, well, give it a try next year again. Well, and you know, that's no different than the brilliant seeder because I could be seeding into that little bit of moisture which sprouts that seed and the same thing it comes up and those heat waves just cook it. Like, I I know I'm going to reseed a lot next year of what I've seeded this year. And this was not a you know, oh, good year for grass at all. If you got it in early, though, I think it was all right. Some of the stuff I think got a, an okay catch. It's trying to get that root base to hold it through the winter. We're going to know more next year. It'll help if we have quite a bit more moisture coming up this fall. I mean, that's not what the harvesters want to see, but if it yeah. does, it would probably help stuff winter over better. Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, continue on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Larry has a question. Not, not, a, not a question on seeding, more a question on uh, spraying. Is what's the plans when you spray in the hamlets? How quick are we going to be back there mulching or doing something? Because uh, the, maybe the green stuff growing up after we brush doesn't suit our public works department, but it certainly looks better than a bunch of dead stuff in the ditches. Yeah, so working with tight crews, trying to get a guy to come through. I'm hoping that we can. I know you're talking about the road. Into Gads being the one by the north of the ball lines. I've been yeah. questioning both that. So, I'm hoping to get one of our small roadside shoulder mowers to go through. Should be probably three weeks, I think, by the time I see one in the area that I can send through quick. If not, I'm going to have to use our quad mower um, because it is too big for our parks mowers to do. And it's pretty rough where some of that is too. It's rough terrain. So that's why I want a roadside mower to come through. And those little Schulte 10 foots. They're almost perfect for that because we're looking at an eight to twelve foot ditch, right? Got to work around that that gas rise. But yeah. No, it's yeah. just that people commented on everything growing, how it was growing back, but now they're certainly commenting on how it looks. It this I'm, way. I'm getting I'm I'm good. Wherever we've sprayed, like this looks terrible. I got brown sticks. Like, it may look terrible in your eyes, but that's exactly what I want. No, it did good. It was a good spray job. So. Yeah. Actually, you know what? Uh, for the dry year we've had, I didn't increase the water rate, which I normally do in a dry year. I, I tried to keep my rates the same as a normal year. Wow. The uptake was awesome. The trees, I think they were just like, this is rain, bring it in. Because it just, anything we touched was like textbook. Well, the drought is good for us. <laughs> like I say, normally in a drought year, you got to increase your water and back off from your herbicide. So that what you're trying to spray thinks that it's rain and opens up their pores. This year the trees didn't think that they just opened up, so that was great. <laughs> Nothing else. <laughs> oh, uh, Ernie, just kind of curious. They're saying in Bath over the the ground squirrels. Yeah. How do you control them? We he gets a pipe and he calls. Yeah. yeah. And I I want it in all the. <laughs> <laughs> we use, we have been using for the last little while in our municipal areas, our parks around here, museum, a product called Rocon. So it's essentially um, a bubble bath with 
mustard in it. So I apply that with some water and I use a special nozzle that aerates the, it's like putting bubble bath in your jet tub. It's kind of soapy, whatever. As soon as you turn the jets on, it just thickens right up. So it's like flooding the gopher hole. You put the nozzle down the hole and you, you fill it full of foam and it occupies the airspace, essentially suffocating them. And you're using a lot less water to do so. The problem is it's a lot more time consuming because strict nine, which I can't use on my grounds anyways, but strict nine, you would take your bucket and your quad and you'd go do every 10th hole and you get 90% control where I have to fill every hole right suffocate them and then we we go back and we fill the holes in so we know where we've been um a request came in for a ball tournament in Boston for the August long weekend so we went out and we were doing when we were doing go for control work anyways um earlier in the year somebody in Both had a couple dogs that was going and helping us with go for control so instead of having a, a hole that, that an eight ball will go down, I had a hole that actually I've got a picture of one of our staff standing in it. You can't see his knees like in the ball lines. Ouch. And he thought it was okay. He was helping us. And I was like, you can't. But he said, well, I can't control my dogs. Well, <laughs> use a little strict knife. <laughs> I'll control the dogs. Um, so yeah, that's. It's a little more time consuming, but that's what we're using is a Rocon product, which is. What's the price difference between the two? Like, like are we. Uh, well, just generally, is it more expensive? The bottle of a strict nine was $11 or $13. $13, I think it is. And that'll do, I don't know, an acre of land in medium density. A four liter jug is 70 bucks and I can do probably an acre of land. Ouch. So oh, it's a little more money. Ooh, a, little a little more money. That's a lot more money. Here's the thing. I, as a municipality uh, worker, I can't use strychnine. No, I, 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 and I don't know what Rosal costs. Rosal is a, is, is a lot like warfarin bait for mice. So it's a multi feed. They got to come back four and five times before it kills them. Um, that's the other option for registering ground scale control. I haven't looked into that. I know some other towns use it in their ball diamonds, in their parkways. That's something I'm looking at for this winter. What would that cost? I'm, UFA, I'm not going to buy it and supply it to ratepayers. You can buy it at UFA, you can buy it at, at PD Mart. I'm not competing with those guys. Um, what we might look at is uh, uh, Charlie Nemitz has a Rosal applicator. It looks like a square hopper. It, it's a three-point hitch, and it's got, I think it just has one, almost like a cultivator shank. And he'll do, I think he does, I think he said eight passes around the outside of his field, and then he'll set up bait station. It looks like PVC pipe, because you're allowed to have bait stations for Ozol. And he'll do that. And he says he gets really good control. It, he'll come in and buy six bottles of strict nine to top off his fields every three, four years. So it looks like a good alternative to strict nine. Maybe it's quicker because you're not baiting every hole, you're putting bait stations out, but you're ripping through the first, call it 100 feet in your field, applying your, and you got it, it's time, it's, it's a time based precision accuracy you got to get out there at the right time and create these tunnels for gophers to get into and feed but it's a tool so maybe it's something we look at charlie said his cost him about eight thousand dollars and he told me how long ago he bought it and i can't remember but i'm going to say 10 years ago he bought it you know and you use it and then you're done so because we can't sell strict nine maybe that's an avenue that we can talk about in in our strategic plan, maybe we look at buying one as a to put in our rental fleet, right? That that people can use. I don't know. And there's also you can uh, also uh, kill moles with a product that's put under surface too, isn't it? Yeah. Well, moles you'd want to inject in the ground as well. But yeah, it, 
it would go your your Same your machine golfers would actually be controlled as well. Yeah. Plus, yeah, go ahead. Um, but when you say you don't want to compete with UFA, et cetera, or PV Mart, can we buy this maybe through RMA so that our producers would have a more cost effective, not to compete with them, but a more cost effective supply, similar to what they've had, you know, as we transition them into strict nine, if we have the machine to do it, is all I'm asking. We can totally look into that idea to see if I can both buy. Um, Rosal, I just don't want UFA, PV Mart, whoever who sells it at, pick a number, 20 bucks a bag, and I'm selling for 17, mad at me, but we, that's something for sure that I can look at. Well, from an egg services basis, that yeah. we're, we're helping our producers. For sure. And then we, to be quite honest, the next two, three years would be a total crapshoot, how much I would bring in. Like, I don't know how far a bag of Rosal goes. I would be a little skeptical of that because I'll be honest. I mean, and I hear what you're saying, Larry. I, I understand that, but that almost gets to the point of we buy our fuel at a really good price too. Do we now start selling fuel to our producers? Well, that would be a much better savings than than um, you know just. No, I, I I do understand that. It's, it's, a, I, it's a that is. I hear what you're saying, but it's a very that's a. But we're selling strict nine. We're hope we're wanting but nobody else can. We're wanting producers to um, try to keep ahead of, of this so we don't further the infestation problem. No, and I, I to kind of cushion it from from because you can say a little bit, but from thirteen to seventy bucks, like that is that's huge money. Oh, I but that's real con. That's no, I, I understand, but I mean a number like that. That's if even if it's double, it's still it's it's huge. And I don't. Get I don't start you know, using twos again. Yeah. I honestly don't think Mr. Clark, the producer, is going to come by Rocon. Yeah. Like it's just it. It's just in the so public area. If you if you took both the Bull Diamond and the little bit of call a park space that goes to the north and to the east, back to the large tree line, we probably spent three weeks of two people over you know May and June, and then again in that late July. Doing go for control like it is. It is definitely something for a parks area. That's all you keep it for. It's effective, but holy cow, is it slow and expensive? You know, <clears throat> like I said, for for the county to buy Ro Ro uh, Rosal and try in our parks, I'm all game for that. For sure, I am. I obviously I'll make sure that it's safe around canine and 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 children, but. I'm sure it is. Other municipalities are using it in their towns. I'll, I'll look into that for sure. I'll look. At, I don't. I haven't got a clue what rules will cost. I haven't, because I always said, well, you can go get that at UFA. That's go there, right? But yeah, I can look into prices. Just find out the pricing. You're right. It doesn't hurt all the price, even if it's for us to use instead of roll roll con. Um, yeah, that's there. All things that we can discuss in our strategic plan too is like an applicator even and and these products. So and I guess while we're discussing things, I'm just going to pop back to uh, wheat spraying one more time or tree spraying, I should say. Yeah. Um, I noticed uh, west of my place, the the county had sprayed a half mile of trees in that ditch, and holy man, did they smoke them! They are just black. And the whole tree, like some years you find where it's maybe maybe just catches top growth, but these whole trees are not super high, maybe as high as this counter, but wow, did they smoke that mile half mile trees and it looks good. So something we did this year in, in the past for the last I guess as long as I've been here, we have used um Dow products or now Cortiva products for weed and brush, right? And our brush product was called Garlon XRT. It is, and I've always been trying to wait for someone else to bring something in because what I keep telling you as a producer is don't use the same product every year. You're going to build up weed resistance. So I don't want to do that in our ditch. I'm only hitting the ditch once every three years for the basic vegetation program, but I still don't want to build that resistance up. So Bayer has finally got a few products that have been over for a few years, but I wanted other guys. To, I didn't want to be the guinea pig this year. I let other guys try them, right, on a bigger product. So 
we split the bottom third of the county, not quite 56, but essentially probably 56 east was Bayer products. We used Novius and Truvis. Novius was used on our brush and Truvis was used on our weeds. And then west of 56, we used Cortiva products. Garland for the brush, clearly for the trees. So in three years time, when I come back, I'll switch that and I'll use Cortiva products in the east and Bayer in the west. So now I've got essentially a six year rotation, keeping my reed resistance lower it's not as low as it should be because by the book there's there's schedules or groups of herbicides and you should switch from a group two to a group four to a group 26 i'm still in the same group i can't get away from that because of industrial products are all the same group but at least i'm using a different product right so you had bayer products in your part of the county and yeah i'm super happy with it it's um, mixing and loading is slower because it's a it's a powder. It's like making a jug of iced tea. So we gotta we gotta mix in the morning and fill our pods. Whereas Cortiva products for brush is liquid. Pour the jugs in, get out of here, go. Right? It's a lot. Has anybody here used Reclaim? Or or yeah, that's really the only one. Uh, it is. It's like mixing ice tea. Yeah. So you got to take your 10 liter jug and you fill up your, your jugs in there and get it in suspension, get it all mixed up and then put it into the pot, fill it with water and then leave. So it, it is a little longer in the morning. Um, or actually what we do is in the evening when they come in at two or three o'clock when it's windy, that's when it mix. You can't spray, but you can be loaded for morning. It does take a little longer, but it's, it's showing some good results. Um, Price per jug is more money, but price per acre or hectare sprayed, uh, they're within dollars of each other and doing really well. The clear view for weeds, I think, is still doing a better job on weeds, but the Novius on brush is doing a better job than Garlon, which I'm really happy to see. And like I said, it's been it's been out for four years. But like I said, I'm, I'm just tired of being the guy trying a road and it's not working the way I wanted. So you know what? Let Pinocchio try it. Let Nicole try it. Let Painter try it. Yeah, what would you guys think? And some guys are still using Aspect, which is the old Toro 101. They just can't get out of the pit for them, which we really have gone away from. I keep 22X for the hard to kill toad plaques, hard to reach areas where I'm spraying you know, a tenth of this room kind of a thing. But on a bigger basis, we're going to those products that are a little more environmentally friendly and I'm using 168 grams per hectare, right? Half of this cup on a hectare of land, two and a half acres of land, right? It, it's definitely a product going farther, which is good to see. Yeah, that's good. And Wayne? But I noticed a couple of uh, some complaints coming in on the from on the great beer request about uh, spraying. So I just wondered, was that effectiveness of spraying? Uh, one was overspray. Um, early season on, it. I've always told the guys when you're using the hand that you got to make sure that the tree is dripping wet coming down, and. The wind was pushing against them, so they streamlined the handgun more to get on the tree, and it went through the tree. <laughs> and so we, we killed like a half an acre of alfalfa. It's all it's all hayland. This whole corridor is hayland, except for like three acres in the corner where he just didn't see to the corner, and that was alfalfa. And I, I cooked it, and I cooked it good. <laughs> Uh, another one thing halfway do anything halfway so I've already spoke with him and I just said like yeah we definitely did this this was us uh, what I wanted then I'll reseed it but I want to wait till next year because maybe it'll come back right might not and there's no sense seeding alfalfa now even if we get more moisture it's not I even told him that when when we first sprayed it there's no sense seeding it now. I'll seed it. If it doesn't come back, we'll seed it next year for sure. So, 
Yeah, we got about a half an acre. Right along the fence. Was that old Meyer? That old was, yeah, Todd, Todd Shower. Yeah, just, just right on the edge. Yeah. Out yeah. yeah. of the, the side of the road, would have been painter mental. What is his job? Is it an environmental? He does well, so he's just not. Yeah, he's a, he, but he does the, the environmental audits too. So. Yeah. He's a Elkhart boy. Well, right? He is, yeah. And I know him from the, the painter's days. And I mean, he can come across as being a stickler and a nasty guy, but he's, he's really good to work with. And, um, um, yeah, a lot of them were, why'd you spray this brush? And it's like, well, if you remember back, we had a brushing agreement. We brushed this and we're spraying the regrowth. Um, I got another one that he's been hard to get a hold of. We actually killed some canola. Again, just overspray with the brush um, in our right away. So I killed my canola that he seeded. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. there's been a few of those. Yeah. You, you killed my crop. Well, if I get the tape measure out. I don't know my crop that you seeded for me. How do you want to work with this one, right? Yeah. So you do that? I'll put fire in the ditch. <laughs> That's what it, yeah, I made a joke about that. And then I guess the one complaint or concern was with the reach, the the spray didn't get all the way to the fence. But that Quentin's addressed that with uh, it's if the distance was too great on some of those wider uh, roads, so it's going to be it's still in the works to be. The 99 foot right away, my spray trucks, I can't touch fence post. I can't. I don't have a big enough pump. And I got the biggest pump they make for roadside spray. I mean, I can, I can buy a, another Godwin six inch pump and put it on my truck and boy, I can reach, but that's not. That's yeah, well, we, we've seen spray. lots of crop. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've been speaking with, that's Mr. Don Rover. I've been speaking with him all season. We're gonna get there. Well, you haven't, you didn't get this. No, you're right. The wind's changed. I can't get that. I gotta wait. We're working on it. We're down trying to get it again today. And I, I don't know which way the winds are blowing. We'll see. Okay. It, yeah, I keep touching base with them. And then I feel like after I'm done calling them, I get a call or email from you saying this guy complained. It's like, I just spoke to him. So. <laughs> okay. But no, I mean, it's in the works, but it was just a different complaint. It was, the reach wasn't quite there. He's after a weed that's actually a native plant. He doesn't want his field, even though it is a decent forage. It's milk veg. It is a decent forage. It is invasive, but it's a native plant. We'll still, it wants it gone, we'll take care of it. It's in my dish, no problem. Like I've always said, in my, on my right away from this fence line to this fence line, I want nothing but grass. I don't want dandelions. I don't want nothing. I want nothing but grass. That's, that's a, that's a perfect world ditch, right? It speeds up mowers up. It's easy for snow removal. Nothing's hanging up. I'm not attracting deer. Deer aren't hiding trees, right? That's a that's perfect. We're not there. It's better. It's even better if the uh, rate payers Yeah, absolutely. This um, spraying too. One thing is our staff really has to be trained to have an eagle eye for the uh, the wormwood because. You know, a lot of places I see there's a little bit of wormwood in the ditch that didn't get sprayed, and, and maybe it was small when they went by. Maybe I don't know, but just boy, eagle eye that stuff. I can <laughs> concur with that. And we're getting there. I mean, again, in an ideal world, at the same two people are using the spray trucks every year because then they get that continuity and they see what they're missing, and their their eye is trained at a younger age in the year for those younger plants. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the earlier stuff. Yeah, there's a pile of that that was missed, but when they went by, they might have been this tall. They might have not recognized, recognized it. Yeah, right. It's none of a silvery so, green. Yeah. No, yeah. Sorry yeah. for interrupting your report so many times, but uh, Ernie? About a month and a half ago, there was a great pier north of town that said that some canola was from an overcrib. But like he had sprayed some trees on the south side and it crossed the road over to his. So I'm just wondering like, whether you had received that. That's. Mr. Nehouse, yeah. that's the one I can't get a hold of. Okay. Yeah, every time I call, is no, we're, I'm trying still. I left, a, to... I left a message with him on a Friday and I never got back to him. He was more kind of, when his phone is concerned, he said, you are going to follow up. And he says, so I've left the last message with him. Um, and we did 
did spray both sides of the road there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Continue then. Um, upcoming project here in the next. I see I'm working some topsoil now. Um, a deal has been made to help with the skate park. We're going to go use our hydro seeder and seed the edges, the new topsoil around the new addition to the skate park. That should be, like I said, I see I'm working topsoil now, so next week and a half or so I should be doing that. Tree calls, a pile of tree calls this year. Um, aphids, cupping leaves, leader branches losing their leaves. Um, and we're still getting those calls. Um, the uh, ladybugs, is it hot weather? They don't like hot weather or something? Because they're the they're the natural defense to the you're right. but, and you're gonna see those ramp the ladybird beetle ladybug is gonna start ramping up here in the next three weeks or so. They really kick it into high gear in the fall. Okay, because I we we've had some aphid issues and um to the point that it was killing some of our my wife's plants and she's losing it. So so typically when we have a normal year with a lot of spring rain, summer rains that washes and disturbs those eggs before they hatch. Uh, because of the dry year, aphids were aphids have ladybugs and cold weather rain as their predators. And we haven't had the rain yet, ladybugs are coming. So I'm still getting calls of aphids. Aphids should be uh, three weeks in May, maybe a little bit of June. Holy, I got aphids and then they're gone, right? They're, we're still seeing them, we're still getting calls on it. Cupping in the leaves, I get lots of guys calling me saying someone sprayed my trees, my leaves are all cupping. If it's just an actual cupping of the leaves, it's actually a sign of drought. Your tree is saying, I need water. Um, and we're seeing that all over. Even in my yard, I'm seeing that. I'm trying to water without going over on my water bills, right? It's, it's a sign of extreme dryness. And our trees are starting to hurt a bit. Same with the leader. The leader branch, when it's losing its leaves, what it's doing is the tree is dying back to a dormant stage. The, the tree is not dying, it's wrong word used. The tree is going back to a dormant stage, so it's dropping those outer leaves back to its base just to hold itself through the summer when it's dry. Um, yeah, so we're, we're still getting a lot of that kind of call. Uh, Red Deer River inspections, we didn't get as much inspected as we wanted to because we're having a hard time floating that river. <laughs> uh, the last time we were on it, we did more portaging than we did floating, so we stayed off. Uh, as of August 3, we conducted some fusarium samples for the province. Grasshopper surveys, I've got about three days-ish left on my surveys. There's nothing. There's hoppers out there, but not, uh, we're not near thresholds. Whereas, in it, if I was to guess, I'd say we're still three years out before we have higher numbers. Well, so what's your area like, grass? Well, not quite a few. You know, ours is too. Building up to good. It looks bad. You're seeing lots of grasshopper, but the pest grasshoppers are low numbers. You're seeing lots of other hoppers that aren't pests to grass and crop. You're seeing what hoppers. They're eating grass and they're eating crop. <laughs> the Wallace doesn't declare them as a pest. <laughs> For the two striped, the Packard, the Magnatory, right? The Bruners, those are the ones we're looking at. So, and I agree. Um, if we get a back to back dry year, so it's going to be more of a problem. But For sure. at this stage, they're not a problem, like a huge problem. But yeah. 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 And the numbers are coming up. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we should be looking at club root surveys end of this week, start of next, we'll start surveying some fields. So do we have um, any data or some sort of study on whether club root excels in a, a dry season or it is reduced in a dry season? Studies have shown it's reduced in a dry season. Studies, studies have shown that club root excels in warm, moist conditions. So when you get your hot summers with a lot of rain, that's when you see the spores growing and spreading more. So we should typically be seeing a, 
the decline. That's what, that's what the studies have been telling me. Yeah. Um, yeah, so because of declaring local state of disaster, spent quite a bit of time conducting surveys with with uh, producers in each of the wards, trying to get a general idea of what's going on uh, for the RMA. There's a report now. You can't just say, well, we're dry. you got to fill out a 12-page report with RMA. Um, and certain things are requesting. So some time was spent on that. And then uh, equipment sales, or rentals, sorry, haven't gone out quite as much. We're starting to pick up again with, uh, with our cattle scale and, and magpie traps. And strict nine sales are done for 2021 for the 2021 year. So we sold 153 and three quarter cases. So we have about 144 cases left to sell for people to use in 2022. I can't sell after March 4 of 2022. So the plan is we'll start advertising shortly, but I'm going to start selling after September long. And they'll be signing up, David, saying, I, I won't use this until 2022. Will you be selling in 2022? Or yeah, I'm going to, I'll sell the, the whatever, the week after September 1, yeah. up until March 4. Well, I don't even know what day of the week that is, but I'll just continue selling until March 4, until I can't. <clears throat> um, honestly, I thought I would have sold more this year. I didn't have very many repeat customers at all. Very few. So I I guess that's a good thing because more people had a chance of getting strict nine instead of one guy coming in time after time saying I need more, I need more. So I had a couple people phone in prior to get the stop. At least one that I talked to directly and said that they were told that they had to wait till after September. They probably purchased their amount for the year, and that would have been something the ladies would have told them. Two days what's up? How many cases? Uh, so what we did was we took your five-year average, and let's say you buy three cases per year. So you're you would have been given three cases plus one to buy this year. You've been allowed four cases. Yeah. If you typically bought six cases in a year, you've been allowed seven. So I've uh, taken your five-year average to make sure that I didn't catch a good year or a bad year in purchasing. So September, if that was four cases last year, you could purchase four cases now? Who was your problem? Rodney Marion. He didn't buy very much at all. I, I, a couple of cases. Cases I think he bought two. But he asked to buy another two. Yeah. So he's, he's not one of the frequent flyers that buys over and over, right? Yeah. And workshops. So I have been talking trees with Toso on Tuesdays. Uh, we've had, we had set up 10 seminars, so we're done half of them. Uh, yeah, I got five left. Um, we've been talking pest and disease. We've been talking spring care, summer care, what to do in a drought situation, maintenance, we talked, uh, the last one we just had yesterday was on uh, fall planting, next one will be spring planting and tree care. Are we posting notes to our YouTube videos or what are we doing? Yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a Zoom meeting that's recorded on YouTube, so I guess just like council meetings. Yeah. Okay, they can join the meeting live, ask questions, which... Uh, just the timing, I, I mean, I would love to go, but at, at 10 o'clock at 1 o'clock, I'm, unfortunately, I am actually, believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe, but I do once in a while have to work. Yeah. One o'clock, that you have to snooze, isn't it? Okay. Shh. <laughs> they are recorded. They're on YouTube. You can go watch them later. Um, I'm just wondering if, if it was possible to throw one in the evening just as a as a try-try to see if we could get something in the evening. A number of people have said to me, well, not a number, one or two that I've talked to, that we talked about it, and they all said the same thing. It's kind of a tough time to... Um, if you're retired, perfect. Yeah. But if you're um, actually still employed, it's a little tough. I can speak to them to see if we can uh, change yeah. if it's pre-recorded and, and done as a, 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 a flyout at one seven o'clock, yeah. just to see if you get some numbers with it. I don't. 
because the, the, the few videos that I went back and looked at, I've had 19, yeah. 20 views. Some of those are me, I guess, because I'll go to click and look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. I'll binge watch one day. For sure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we post it on Facebook too. If you can't make it, you'll watch it later. If you've got a question or a, a bug you have, a disease you're looking at, shoot me a text, give me a picture, message us on Facebook, and that's, 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 that's a good nice. idea. I did. I'm not I'm getting any messages there either. Okay. But we are, I'm, I know people are working, trying to get it out there. If you can't see it now, you're going to watch it later. What's your question? I'll ask it. I've got a couple for you. Okay. Fire away. Uh, and then we are going to co host with Stepper Egg Society, a regenerative farming conference. There is a three part conference March 19, June 18, and one more date yet to be determined. Um, I think that's going to be kind of interesting. And then, sort of regenerative farming. And then future workshops, water well workshop. Uh, I just got a notification. They, they accepted my request for workshops. We'll start working some dates out there. Um, looking at maybe another ladies livestock clinic. Um, those were a hit in the past. We'll see if there's some interest in, in setting something up. You know, we did the actual calving. We did your your vaccination. Now what's next? Well, let's look at spring, summer. How are we going to pasture these things? We're just going to try and keep the clinic going, stepping them through an entire year to see what it's like. Um, and then, yeah, I guess I've had quite a bit of calls on plant health. So maybe we'll do something along the lines of an agronomy update for... Uh, our area, we'll do some agronomics and we can split it up between crops and then uh, look at maybe a gardening flower, front yard flower kind of an idea and see if we get some interest that way and some some people are trying to keep their yards going. A lot of um, interest in small greenhouses. Like I know that um, PB Mart was sold a ton of little small uh, greenhouses so people are I don't, I don't know if it's I know that's it's still horticultural and it's still part of it's not egg as such but it is no, a still, still part of it right mm -hmm. yeah um, um, uh, another thing maybe to look at depending on what kind of runoff we have was except for just alternate watering for for livestock that's producers. a good idea yeah. you drive around so you get that watering, and every little bottle is dried up I don't know where the cattle are watering at so uh, uh, like what did they uh, like the nose pumps or the solar pumps or the yeah we used to have an off-site watering system that guys could come demo that you could use out of alternate sources to keep your creek clean or your dugout clean, yeah. clean. Mm -hmm. um, it's got lots of cows got mud up it's just they're really things. low they keep tramping them up makes it worse you know i did see a tank on a trailer for sale in the Botha area that could be used as a water source for cows. I'd well, that, that one out by the highway right on the curve. Yeah, the real ugly one with a big dent in it. I don't know. The hey, yeah, I'm trying to help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if it helps someone, they like can just, like, that's what we used to water our trees with. Yeah. If it helps someone, by all means. No, I mean, that's for sure something to look at, right? Some of these shallow wells you can put a nose pump on might be a good idea. We'll see. Um, yeah, so then uh, just some projects we've been spraying there. So Roshan Sand, this is this is at the intersection of what was Buffalo View Estates and then going into Old Bowling. So to the left of this picture is the, the private road that Bowling owns. That's where it's going. So you're looking kind of to the west. Looking at some brush control. Uh, now I've been getting phone calls about the spraying up there. They're wondering why and where and what for, you know, because uh, they know what pathways have been talked about, but uh, they said some of the spraying was going where you wouldn't put a path. So they're wondering why, because they like the natural vegetation look. We love some natural vegetation. Look at that. We're just trying to keep a nice 
long parkway open, right? We, we, we aggressive is the wrong word to use, but we got aggressive with some, with our brushing and trying to get rid of some old vegetation and, and get things cleaned up and opened up that we can encourage kids to not play on the road kind of an idea, right? So now let's just keep it that way. Let's keep that grass with the canopy look. So it's mostly bringing in encouraging grass to grow. If I may, yes. the association up there was communicated to you very thoroughly on that. So we were going to do the entire area and then leave clumps of trees and get it down so we can mow the whole thing regularly with the parks mowers. They were very much aware of it. They seem surprised, or some do now. Um, but it's not just where our pathway is going to be. It's that entire right of way up there we're trying to get control of and maintain. Well, we also talk about safety up there all the time, visibility, and all you have to look is further to the west, I guess it would be, and see where the other municipality comes in. And that is a very crowded road, and that was one of the biggest things we were doing was trying to increase visibility for safety and, and allow other places for the kids to be. And you know what? It, it's amazing the difference. Like, you can see around that corner nicer now. You can... You know, you're not scratching your trailer coming down the road like it's opened up. It's it's really nice. So we're just trying to keep it that way. And it does give people an option or a place to walk besides on the road. They can actually have a place they can walk. And you know, we've we've recently got some phone calls on on, on our gravel pathways east of here, and then the the water storage uh, compound and the sewer sewer storage compound poisons being put down. I, I just explained to them one of the time that this is the idea, this is what we're doing, and it's that it's not poisonous. I don't use carcinogenic products. You know, the freshwater tanks are sealed. Nothing can get in. That's the idea. I'm not spraying into the tanks. I'm getting rid of vegetation around the tanks. So we are we are getting some of those phone calls as they see us and, and one thing I've done more this year than other years is I advertise the heck out of it that I'm actually going to be there. I put signs up ahead of time saying, hey, you'll see us tomorrow or the next day, right? This is where we're going to be. And it's not just one or two signs. Like this road you have here you see now, that road, Bayview Street, they say I had 100 signs from the corner of what was Buffalo View Estates all the way to where we meet in Summer Village. I bet you I had at least 100 signs. Every 60, 70 steps, I put one in. So it's not like it was a surprise, right? And I the right, right on there with the product I was using, the phone number to call me, and actually the only phone call, or not even a phone call, the only complaint I had was the one when I spoke to you, whenever that was, where the guy came out at me. Well, that was when they were tearing, putting the blocks back in for parking. <laughs> right after the time. <laughs> yeah. So someone angered him, and I happened to be there. It really was off, I guess, but the target on the door yeah but you know we've had some comments too that it looks great what you're doing is a great job and, and i've got complaints so or I've, I've got compliments on it they're they're happy to no complaints it, it really is they're quite actually quite happy with it. and i think you're on the right track with uh, letting you know beforehand what's happening with the product is because that may be what their question is when they call in is what you've just already and what I'm putting down, if they were to Google it, they realize it's not safe. safe that they got seven choices of something. I'm putting down this active ingredient, and it, this is what it is, right? So it's coming along. It really is. Okay. Right. Just one other question with the health, health and safety. What does a hazard assessment look like? Can you explain to us what the kind of the, the steps are when you go through that? Like, so what we're doing is... When I take Andrew up and say, we're going to spray this, we'll have a toolbox meeting and we'll kind of explain the general outcome of what's going on. And here's a few of the hazards you may come across. Then we do our hazard assessment that focuses Andrew on this job specifically. What's going to hurt you? What's going to hurt you physically, physically, chemically, biologically, right? What do I have to watch it for? Not great fears coming out of the absolute. Oh, okay. So we have angry, angry public, angry repair. What's the issue? Well, they could be mad because they see me in the suit spraying something, or they could be mad because I'm creating dust in front of their house. Okay, how am I going to mitigate that? I'm going to make sure that I know the product I'm using 
it is safe to handle. I'm applying it like this. You can come on the grass at this time. What else? Well, I got unlevel ditches. Okay. How are we going to mitigate that? Make sure I'm wearing sturdy, sturdy boots. I'm going to make sure I'm being aware that maybe I don't walk down here where it's steep. I go over there and come in from this angle and work from down below. Right. We talk about getting to the site from the site. You're driving up there. Right. What are my hazards? I got wildlife. I've got motor vehicle collision. I'm going to mitigate that. I want to make sure I get a good night's sleep. I'm going to make sure that I drive defensively, that I make sure that my headlights are on, right? So this one is a river check. So he's got down driving. He's got wildlife. So this, everything is based one to three. There's no zeros. There's no fours. So severity, what's it going to do to me? A one is, is minor injury, do I need a band-aid? Two is lost time injury, where I'm going to be spraying my ankle, and three is fatality. A possibility, one is unlikely it's going to happen, two is likely, and three is it will happen, right? And then exposure, how often am I exposed to this hazard? One is, is rare, once a week or once a month, two is a couple times a week, and three is every day. So then you get a total, right? So you rank all your hazards, and there's only eight slots on the page, so we're not putting down every single hazard they're exposed to. What are the big things? I'm driving, that's pretty big. And your eight pair, that's pretty big. This year and last year, you're going to see COVID-19 on like 90% of them. So is this each individual person does one of these for a different job? Is that how that works? It's for each crew. Oh. So if I send Andrew by himself, he fills this out. After lunch, I come up to help him. And you can say, hey, thanks for the help. Let's go through what I've got down here and we review it and then I sign off with him. So it's now I'm part of his crew. Is that drowning is what he's saying? Yeah. Okay. And boating? Boating. So the task is boating, bailing, uh, falling into the water or drowning is the hazard. So drowning is the task? No. No, the hazard. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, it's driving. Oh, driving. Hazard is apparently I'm not. I shouldn't be filling one of these out, or maybe I should be. <laughs> drowning shouldn't be on there, but falling into the water is the hazard, and the outcome is drowning. It is falling into the water the hazard? That's that. It's still an outcome, right? You've got water there. Correct. How do you mitigate? Correct. Anything related to the water. And then trips and falls. I don't want to see, but it's on there. Um, that's an outcome again, right? It is. I don't want to see slip trips and bolts. Everybody says, oh, that's that's my hazard assessment. No, it's not. You're looking for the the hose across the ground, right? the unlevel terrain, that's, uh, I think that's my slip, my trip, my fall. Those are my hazards. Mm -hmm. The me getting hurt because I slipped is the outcome. I don't want to, yeah. Right. Anyways, and they go through it, identify how they're going to uh, mitigate this the best way possible. So can we eliminate it? Yes. Then, then do so, right? Um, for this one, um, let's see, firefighting. Well, this was a unique one. We were I I helping that one. Of uh, course, <laughs> sorry. Uh, for the first day. So the hazard wildlife when they're driving. Can you eliminate that? Yeah, we got 25 foot fences all the way up high 56. Perfect. I don't want to see that in the hazard assessment ever again. It's been done. It's been dealt with. Uh, wildlife's not going to happen. If you can't eliminate it, what can we do engineered to fix it? We're going to use our seat belts. We're going to use a vehicle with a rollover protection system. That's going to keep us safe. If we can't put something like that in place administratively, what can we do? Our policy says we're driving 85 kilometers an hour on every two digit highway in the province. That's our policy. If we drive slower, we can see the wildlife. That's our rule. If we can't do that, then we use PPE. We're going to wear a hard hat in the truck. Is that going to keep us safe? Those are kind of your steps. That's your hierarchy to fill out the hazard assessment. Thank you for that information. That's important. I, I, I think that's a. Right. Well, like you say, we always strive for a toolbox meeting where it's generally here's your scope. You've got to make this piece of land slope two degrees. Uh, we're washing for water and we're going to put a building here in the middle. Your hazards could be weather, traffic, repair, other right. equipment, right? Okay, thanks boss, got it, he leaves. Now the crew goes, okay, so what do we see today? We got high power lines, we have open traffic here, we got public coming through. How are we gonna deal with all this stuff? And then they set up how to keep themselves safe. Path by path. 
task by task. And you change that as your work zone changes. So you started off with a piece of land and by noon, all of a sudden you've got a half-assed crowned road with deep ditches. Hey guys, after lunch, we're gonna redo our hazard assessment because now things have changed. Or you had a torrential downpour, now it's slippery. Things have changed enough. Let's refocus on this. Is everything still here? Yeah, well that's no longer there, but now we have this, right? It's a working document as far as, as long as you're on that. Dust is gone and now it's slippery. Okay, Ernie, is that? When you think think your QR and CQR, they use more of the model. If you can think it, it can or it will happen. So you try to minimize as much as you can, make everyone aware of everything that could be happening. The idea is to focus yourself on the job, right? All the way up to the lake, Andrew and I are talking about his wedding coming up this summer, my new kid on its way, or Rick just got divorced. You're not focused on the job yet, so you know none of that. <laughs> no, you're getting married again, Andrew. When did you get pregnant? Starting <laughs> the show. So get your job site by sitting down at and grabbing the hazard assessment cave box and this was the thing. It takes those conversations out and it zones you in on this is what we got to do. And if I may as well, we got to also be careful because you know, we've had these conversations with people before about where you stop. I can fill out 50 pages and keep going and I just burn my whole day doing hazard assessments. So you're looking for the the more normal, visible things, not every little thing like a UFO coming down and you know dispatching you up to the moon or something like that. Like you could keep going forever, but the goal there is what are our common regularly happening things that we can adjust for that we should adjust for, right? Because you got to draw a line at some point. In the past, we had more smokers. We're starting to get a little smokers, so I've got to figure out something different. But I always said a hazard assessment should take you as long as it takes you to have a cigarette. About seven minutes. Here's the jobs. Hey, guys, what do you see? What do you see? I'm going to write it all down. Okay, where are we at? How do we get to the hospital? And we have the questions. Oh, we forgot about that, right? Yeah, okay, pass it around, sign off on it, let's go. And after they work here for a while, they should recognize the key hazards pretty quickly. And they have a carbon copy book. So when you were at Southwest of 8 for the day doing road construction, and then three days later, you're back out there again, you go back to them, well, this is what we had before. All these are still here, but this is going to be easy. Here we go. Any questions? Oh, we got this one. Oh, yeah, right. And then we okay. No, that sounds good. Are there any other questions for the administration report? Did you have anything to further to add, Devin? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Pretty pictures. We kind of dissected this report this month, <laughs> every which way. So, okay, I will ask. Oh, uh, Shereen? I was going to just have the motion to accept. Okay, thanks. You. All in favor? And carry it. Yes, we're at, uh, okay, now 7.2, the uh, Agricultural Services Strategic Plan Memo on page 8. Yeah. There's all a chance to read this. So basically, I have highlighted some ideas that I've presented in the past and a few things I tried to not recreate but borrow from other counties that may be applicable to here. I'm just trying to open the conversation as to where you see us going in the future with egg services. There is or will be a 2% increase in taxes, and that money is going to be allocated to egg services, which is roughly, as I forgot to ask Krista, roughly $34-ish thousand dollars that we will transfer into reserves for something. So I am currently putting in, with all my vehicles I put away, like the pickup trucks, I put away $1,000 a year into a savings account for when I need to buy a new one. I put away $1,500 a month or a year. Uh, for my spray trucks. So I'm putting money away in all my capital equipment now, which comes out to, I think it's 34,000 or 37,000 a year. So we have that, that nest being built that we can create a new program, expand a program. I'm just, this is something for strategic planning, which I have to update this year. So now's the time to kind of have those conversations. If there is an idea of we should look at creating this program, now's the time because I can start budgeting it. You know, maybe it's not for 2021, but I can start getting it into 22, trying to make sure I've got everything in a row, or maybe it's as simple as we need to buy another 
widget, I can create that now for discussions for budget. Yeah, you know, time is perfect right now because I guess uh, we have dedicated more fund funding for ASB and we do need a plan and um, it's, it's time to review the strategic plan anyway. So I guess today, if we just want to toss out for Quentin uh, some of the things, basically, even on our wish list, which we'd like to see the direction ASB goes. I think we, he needs to know that so he can sort of start the wheels turning and bringing back information to see if it is, it is or is not feasible. So I guess I'll ask this board right now, are there things that come to mind that you would like to see ASB do or expand? Larry? I guess part that we, we can't forget as we're going through this is one of the reasons we talked about this is with what we went through with budget last year and we were talking about cutting some of the programs, et cetera. So that, that would be part and parcel of what it would be. But also today, even as we went through different watering strategies, different other programs, or if we're gonna have different webinars as things progress, maybe we're gonna have to have feed webinars because people are gonna be feeding totally different. To me, that is pieces that part of that, we do have that so that we can offer that to our producers. Absolutely, part of that in here is that we, you know, in the past, I've had these kinds of webinars and workshops and seminars, and we can ramp up and do twice as many as you as as I have in the past, or we can back up. Part of us, we don't have that crystal ball like as as our year progresses. So that's it's it would be a bit of a question to adjust to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, 2020 was you can't really use that as a year to compare to, but in a, in a normal year. I would say 12 to 14 workshops would be kind of a yearly average. Everything from club root awareness to pest and disease updates to water well workshops, tree planting workshops, calving clinics. We've done winter feeding. Um, we've done swath grazing. We've done, we brought in when Barry Rimshiel was with Alberta Egg, we brought him in and did uh, cow calf economics using, uh, oh man, this program has slipped my mind, but you would bring in your feed protein and your hay sample, and we would build you a feed ration for the first trimester of winter, second trimester of your pregnancy season and your and your calving season. We would design all of that, so. Yes, thank you. I remember I'm on the farm. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> My squirrel gets a nut once in a while. <laughs> we've done we've done wheat workshops where you might have this pretty daisy in your backyard. It's called oxide daisy, and you really like it. Well, instead mm -hmm. of having that, you know, here's four other plants you can grow that still they look just like that, and they're not noxious weeds or you know, I'm a bee lover. Well, we can do. We did a, a, a bee house workshop, beehive workshop. We did a, a here's here's 12 plants or, or trees to grow in your yard or area that attract bees, right? Because everybody's on the dandelion kick that they attract bees. They actually don't. We've we've done. We've, we've tried to really think outside the box. We did precision farming. We partnered with, you know, like the egg society or or. Uh, out of a research group and we do precision farming and we do crop tours you know yeah i think we did that. for a few years we did, did the farm and fork tour we did the long table dinner those kind of all those are all part of that uh, workshop seminar <laughs> um, and what i call my ESA program stuff my cons it's all conservation stuff even though some stuff may not apply as conservation but it's my workshop you know i think that's something that can be expanded for us because information i mean you can never really get too much and, and everything changes you know from year to year there's always something new coming out that you have to keep on top of and, and then you know, we did a survey a few years ago um you know what works do you like workshops yes you know what workshops do you want to see and then nobody really filled out what they would like to see i don't care if you want to build widgets we'll do it i just need to know what people want because I can only guess so long, right? Okay. Actually, we got three people waiting to speak. I'll go with Cherie, Rick, and James. Um, as you were listening to all the topics, I was thinking this year we should have had the wasp control. <laughs> as I have seen a lot, especially on 
Could you need more wasps? I'll give you some. I well, go. I've just seen on social media the, the amount of posts that people say, and I've, I've heard a radio program too, they had a specialist come on and say that this year with the drought and the heat conditions, well, wasps are um, a lot more ferocious and more of them than they're than they have been in the past. So, But um, one of the things I saw in here is you're taking it off program. Yeah. You know, the province I know was getting involved with the registration, but I'm not sure how involved they're going to get with removing the shacks that are still out there that should know. have been taken off. And that's, that's one to talk about now because Lacombe County pulled the pin. They said, we're out. Mm -hmm. We're not doing it anymore. So if we want to continue Buffalo Lake, it's on us to in the past, because Lago Lacombe Lake did Gull Lake as well, so they administered the program and they did it. All I did was give them some funding. If that's something you want to continue, we have to do it ourselves. Maybe partner with Camrose County. Not sure how you want to do that yet, but yeah, there's programs like that too. You Sounds know, like it's a provincial program to me. We did we did uh, fishing derbies to control Prussian carp in in. The Red Deer River in Belkis Pond, in you know, Buffalo Lake's going to get some very quick. And they weren't as big of a hit as when we did them, but we did them when it was really early. You know, we've we've done things like that too. That Buffalo Lake doesn't have the pressure carp yet. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. Oh, okay. Okay. No, that's I. Why, that's why they're not. It's like the river has it, so the it's. River has it. That's why they're not running the pump, the big, the well, big pump racing here, is because Red Deer River has pressure carp. And flowering rush, so they essentially until they can control that, they're not turning it on. Well, but I don't know how the problems. I mean, don't they usually call us if they get a phone call that there's a shack still out there? Who are they going to call to take it off? Are they going to go take it off? That's what I don't know. Well, that's what I'm saying. The problems. The shack busters supposedly taking over this, but what are they going to do when they get that phone call? So, so the last shack that we took off, the local fish and wildlife officer tried, but his winch wasn't near long enough to go out and grab it. He wasn't taking his truck on the ice. Yeah. No. We, we, we rescued it. A metric shit ton of ropes and went and oh. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of that measurement before. There was a group of eight of us, ten of us, that took that off. Uh, that was a, a cheap uh, removal anyhow. Yeah, that, was, that, that was probably a $2,300 touch that day. Wow. Well, if you if you uh, need uh, fuel for all the vehicles and paying all the helpers, then we got, I don't even know, 500 bucks for that shack. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Rick, you have a comment? Yeah, a um, couple of things I want, hopefully, to spur up the conversation, I guess, direction-wise, but we're, we're doing a bunch of stuff administratively right now, trying to prepare the budget going forward. So of the things that have happened in the last year, uh, obviously Ryan had left and we didn't fill that hole specifically. We just adjusted. Quinn put more of a focus on on Egg himself again this year. And I guess going forward, it would really be helpful to have some directions to how you see the staffing levels go and whether or not you appreciate the trying to ramp up the effort Quinn put into the stuff this year on the communications and the meetings and whatnot for the board. So the, the staffing and, and how we see that going and, and where you want this board's interaction with Ag Services to be, that'll be one of those primary things that we need to budget for. And we don't have a crystal ball right now on exactly how you want to see it happen. The other thing, and I've talked to at least Larry about this recently, is from the rest of the operations group doing brushing and and watching the spraying going on and whatnot, I'm feeling constantly like we're losing ground to trees and brush. And it's more and more difficult. We can go out and do a whole bunch more, but the more we brush, the more attention egg services needs to put on keeping it down or the stuff gets out of control while it's growing back really fast. I think Quentin, you're on a third of the county of year program right now. Um, you know, maybe that's something you need to discuss and revisit because I feel like we're losing ground to things. Um, we've had comments, I think Larry mentioned yesterday, somebody talked to him about our new mowers, getting more of the brush on the sides of the road gone, maybe not into the bigger trees, but we're getting more of an impact with those new mowers. They're obviously slower, but they're doing more. Mm -hmm. So when you look at all this, I mean, I'm, you know, my head just automatically goes to maybe we need to do half of the county each year, but that also has staffing um, costing implications as well. So 
to me, those are two critical things. It's how you see the staff operating going forward and where you want to see the interaction at what level. And then also, are we getting where we need to with the brush? And if we are losing ground, we've got to maybe rethink how we're doing it. My so, personal feeling is we're losing ground. So, okay. And I, now this is a point of administration. I think you guys need to bring that back to this board and give us the numbers because just saying that you're feeling that we're losing ground is great, but I'm not going to sit here and make a decision and tell you to do half the county without knowing what the cost implications to it. So we need to give us that information. And I, I'm one of the guys that harp on, on um, any of the boards that we sit on, whether it be council or MPC or Ag Service Board, give staff the information and tell them what they want to do. In this one, I will turn it around. Give us the information. Tell us what the money is. Tell us what we expect. Tell us why. Which, which we can do. If you feel yeah. the same thing I'm feeling on this. I, I, it's not whether we feel that yet because I don't know. I don't know the information you're you're asking me. I don't know the same things you don't know, um, because unless I know the money, I'm not going to sit here and go, yep, do it. Okay, well, it's my guys that are out there brushing a second and a third time because stuff's growing all the time after we brush it the first time. So those are the we need to know it. Yeah. Well, I see, and the question is, how important is that to you? I mean, if our roads close in a lot more. You know, it impacts our graders, it impacts snow removal, it impacts a lot of other things that we put extra time into. It's hard to quantify exactly. It's just that you see it and you see our crews going out doing stuff over and over again. Bring that report back to us and let us give us a give us that. And that spray and rotation could go into strategic plan too. If it you. should, yeah. Yeah. Hey James. So um one of the things that I would think about and I, I especially this year is gonna be very big. And we talked about roping the web. Uh, and how they, um, the government took a number of stuff off of there and they were going to revamp. But I sent you just a neat, quick email about um, some information of AFIN um, doing a different um, update to roping the web. But um, again, you know, I think everybody's probably heard about the scams that are out there when it comes to hay right now, you know. Yeah, just send me a deposit and you can come pick up the hay and stuff. And yeah, right. Apparently they don't work with farmers very often. <laughs> um, farmers are a fairly um, cautious group when it comes to spending money. Um, but I think we could maybe help facilitate something like that, if not locally, you know, it might be as simple. And I'm just spitballing as, you know, we set up a separate Facebook page for, um, for finding hay or something along that or, an, or a, an adjunction to ours or something. And then also selling animals on, on Facebook. I mean, it, the creative things of people selling horses, we have, I have a halter for sale. Uh, the halter comes with this beautiful, you know, uh, mare with it, but uh, I'm selling the halter for, you know, $5,500 and it comes with a free horse. Um, you know, that's how they're getting around it. And it's interesting. And my wife was selling chickens. I mean, you know, it's uh, give me two clucks for this bird kind of thing, right? <laughs> it's, and it is, it is words that they pick up, right? If you put dollars or bucks in, they start picking up on it. But if there's other words, they don't. So interesting. And I just thought maybe it's something that as a service board, how are we helping facilitate um, for our our agricultural people within the community that the other one for hay especially I hate bringing in weeds from other jurisdictions and we're going to do that again and you know should it be a bulletin that you know if you're buying from this particular area be forewarned that there is club root in that area we know that whatever county A has a you know it's a major outbreak of club root. If you're bringing straw and hay from that particular area, maybe it's an information package. I don't know. Just something. Okay. Anything further? Um, so I guess. Um, I did have my hand up. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's just to follow up on what Rick did is when we had the complaints about the gravel, I, I went on Grove some roads and I talked to some of the local farmers there. And that's where they come up with how much better the mowing was and with their header situation because they said it was frustrating to get thrown back at you that your headers are too wide now you're buying wider equipment 
and that's therefore you can't go down these roads. Like the one said to me, I've had the same straight cut header for 12 years. He said, I have switched machines, but I've still kept the same header. And he said, it's the same roads I'm going down to the same fields. And he said, now with these rotaries, they're mowing the trees down. But with increased spray, it, it is protecting our assets. And, and and that's just a sign showing that, yes, it has gotten worse. And, and um, that was north of Gadsby. I talked to another one south of Gadsby. He said the same thing. You must be kidding me. There's no trees in Gadsby. Yes, there is. That's actually one thing that is They're growing. only in the ditch. <laughs> that's one thing that is growing. Yeah. Ditch, yeah. There are trees if they're in the ditch. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, I agree that the trees are encroaching and absolutely and they it's just not recently either. It's some years back because they're big, some of them that are so close to the edge of a primary road, like you know, our road network, they're in there. So yeah, it's time to go well, back. And that's something to discuss with, with budget too, you know. Um I know we have increased our herbicide from fifty thousand to hundred and twenty five thousand since I've been here, but you know, some counties you're putting out two hundred and fifty, three hundred thousand dollars worth. You know, if to, to put it in perspective, if I was to use up, if I was to fill my truck with everything and then come up room and spray, I might get the first eight feet of the road for a third of the county, right? Like I have to selectively use what I have. And some of the trees are really too big uh, to spray. Kind of, they they need to be taken out first, uh, Ernie. Just on, on your report there, you're saying to offer a service to control brush on headlands. Do you really want any more work? No, well, they, they, that's that's something that will be a uh, an increase to the to the department. It's not so much brush. For example, with Aspen County does this, they do a headman program. So they have a truck and trailer hauling a 80 horse tractor with a little field spray behind it. Melt them out and they spray your headlands for noxious weeds. You of course pay for the for the chemical, but it's doing two things. It's creating that buffer of killing weeds between you and your neighbor, and it's also creating that headland and keeping that headland where you're not farming to the fence, getting rid of that buffer between you and your neighbor. So it's encouraging keeping that 40 to 60 feet of grass or the, there's a fence line in the middle of headland, and you're controlling for weeds for the producer, you're kind of helping out. Yeah, be an increase. It's you need more staff to do that. You need the equipment to do it. But it's an idea that what Aspen County does, and it seems to work pretty well for them. And I see, like the wormwood, it, see, it often comes into the ditches, and it's only you can see a short distance out in their field. And if it was got right away in that headland width before it keeps going, it would be a good idea. But I mean, there's lots of things we can add into the strategic plan and then sort out which is how many, how many we can do and how many we can. Well, and, and like our POP program that's eight years old, maybe it needs a reboot. Maybe we can start, start over and get yeah, more up to date. And, but it takes, we, we got to be up. Okay. So, what else are you looking for in this? Uh, just maybe um, down the, in the, weeks to come if board members can forward you more things to be considering in the strategic plan yeah and i i would think it would be important that we you know revisit it this again yeah, I mean, if you are as a board member looking at it go through what what was here and and get a an actual hard target of what's going on and any questions um send them in and then give your feedback so, uh, well, Rick? Yeah, so just to follow up a little bit, I mean, when we're talking budget and things like that, we have to adapt to to make things work. And this is, you know, we're not going to change our budget cycle where our year end is at the end of the year. But thinking about it, for most things, ag and construction and everything else, if we were passing budgets in September rather than just starting to talk about them in September, we'd be geared up first of spring with everything we need to just hit the ground running. And those are the kind of you know, if we're not getting budgets until, you know, February, March, April, sometimes or later, um, we're talking about the following year by the time we can react to a lot of things, especially if it's people and equipment related. So, you know, that clear, are we going in the right direction? Do you like the way things have gone with, with, you know, some of the, you know, influxes of more activity into these meetings and whatnot? Is that something you want to build on 
and do we want to continue to build or were you happy with the what had been dragged down from over the last number of years where we had a lot more constrained budgets and we were trying to hunker down a little bit and that's really the biggest part of the question are we building or are we shrinking right? James to that end I wonder if we as a board and maybe um, the county as a whole should not be looking at saying okay there is a base budget that's going to be there there has to be that base budget to kind of give the administration that heads up that you know you are gearing up for spring to get the ground running um, that hey you know that you were going to you might as well buy x amount of spray or whatever because we're going with that at least that is the bare minimum so you guys are ready to rock and roll uh, add-ons then become just that they're either added on or can be just uh, taken away depending on the, the cycle of the economy and the years that are going so that might be something that we should look at not only for this strategic planning but also for um you know council as well November. Was just when the strategic plan planning was going to take place so we have our budget uh survey out for 2022 and we extended the deadline because we hadn't received a lot of feedback yet uh, so this is the preliminary budget survey that gives you an idea of what uh, people in the community are feeling uh, about where they would like funds to be allocated so those results will be presented to you in September and we'll be scheduling uh, strategic planning at the end of September to initially start our strategic plan process. Okay. I don't know. I think, uh, we're ahead of the game now if we're starting to figure out what we need to be talking about before the time comes. Yeah. As James talked about the budget though, we always do typically improve an, in, approve an interim budget, which that could be part of that process too, is just you have your base and if you order something from that, that you can't be held accountable or taken to task because that was ordered and it was something that wasn't approved, basically. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking that. Yeah, and and I do like the way these. Well, this meeting today shows truly we were getting fairly far away from agriculture. The amount of conversation we've been having today. These are this is a lot better meeting than a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did um, brainstorm a lot today and and come up with a lot of ideas for. The future board, I guess. No, I think we're on the right track to, um, if we're going to expand our AESB program slightly, which seems to be the the, um, <laughs> the wish of this board. I think this, we've, we've started the ball rolling and we just need to give our input to Quentin so that he can bring it back. So then, Quentin, on the next one is the actual. Uh, strategic plan down in 10 point yeah so there's two strap plans this is our pretty one that i have to submit to the province saying we will look at us we do these things and this is where if you decided you wanted to for example alternative land um, uh, alternative land stewardship program your ls program land use program it would be in here if you wanted to do a a larger three person conservation workshop where it's year round multiple inputs and we'll come help you do data input it would be in here <clears throat> if you're increasing <clears throat> part of me if you're increasing the amount of roads you're going to spray that's not really part of this as much because we have a roadside spray program that's identifying that we're doing vegetation control but if you're adding a program, the headland program, that will be in here. But it's also going to be part of the one that Nikki facilitates for us, the big oversight that we all do at the county level. So I need input for this. If you see another vision you want to take, I need it for this. But that's at the next level, basically. The, the, the tweaking we do in our own um, plan level. Okay. We're going to do it. Our own plan says this is when and how. Okay. So, <clears throat> probably is that enough for today's discussion? I think on strategic, as long as people follow, we'll follow up next meeting, and people in the meantime can contribute. I'll make the motion we receive for information with instructions that have been given to. Um, 
both the board to bring back any put or any ideas to Clinton and for Clinton to bring back some ideas to us of what he sees and your department sees <clears throat> as a need. So Is that clear? Clarify. I haven't heard anything about pulling any programs back. I'm talking about possibility of beefing a few things up, adding here kind of an idea. That's what I'm hearing. Over. That's what I've heard as well. Yeah. 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 And I I think that's correct. I see shaking and nodding of heads. Um, with that in mind, knowing that whatever you build up is got to be, like we need to know the, the details. And then I think um, this board will, even though it's the same board as council, but I think the general flavor is to probably have a, a, bit, a bigger budget for ASV, and we've already, the tax increase is there, so I think we're all pushing on the same direction mm -hmm. and I guess I just have to stress before we go to the vote on this motion is that uh, this board has to continue uh, to give feedback to Quentin in, in the short term so that he has enough to work with too so, you know, rather than after we get set then have an idea so brainstorm first get everything happening that would be the best is there, is there any further discussion to James's motion I guess I would have one more comment. Things I didn't mention that obviously should be included would be something like our egg service bursary where we have one winner of a thousand. Do you want four? Or do you want it? I think to say the same. You've got your Battle River Research Grant. You've got your seed plan. Like all of those things as well are would be part of that. What do you see? You know, I don't see the really Battle River in that. Yeah. Awesome, but we need to see. I would think lots in our county or, or whatever, something that I can. I think throw everything out there for our next meeting and we'll, we'll get us a checklist. Maybe. Yeah. Like some of these are probably sufficient, but we will decide that. That way. Just uh, to Mr. Chairman, a lot of these are subject to uh, uh, our budget. Absolutely. So yeah. if we get a windfall, we'll, we'll probably increase our bursaries. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a big gift. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll ask for the, the vote now. All those in favor? That is carried. Uh, next meeting is September 22nd. And uh, the uh, seminars and workshops coming up. If you want to go over that. Uh, sure. So like I said in my, in my report, you know, we've talked about Plant disease or uh, pest and disease. We talked about uh, caring for trees in a normal year. We talked about drought year care. You know, so now we, we just finished talking about fall planting. We're going to go into the next one talking about spring planting. We're going to talk about shelter bound planting. Um, really trying to kick back the idea of field shelter belts. Back in the day, it was a thing, you know. 40 feet in from the fence, there was a row of trees. So now my hitter can't go down there. But maybe we look at a row of trees every 100 feet and increase what does that do for your land by increasing value of your moisture and your nutrients. Uh, we're going to talk about um, general pruning timelines, those sorts of things. <clears throat> and if everything goes as planned, we'll have an actual in-person workshop we'll go for a walk somewhere and, and look at some plant health we'll look at some pruning uh, still trying to narrow down that timeline and, and what his fall looks like maybe we wait till spring and go okay here's everything we talked about last year here's a few things i can show you right mm -hmm. talking about uh, yeah the hands on the stick. and i would co make one comment on this i think you need to uh, when you're putting this workshop out, I'm not sure if everybody understands who Toso is. Um, we're phenomenally fortunate to have him, actually. I mean, he he was the uh, tree guy in Alberta forever. Like he, if if there was an issue with trees, it was him. So this guy, like, this isn't just somebody that we found on the side of the road and said, "Hey, can you talk about trees with us?" He's phenomenal. Keep in mind, this is the guy that now is doing um, tree inventory for the city of Edmonton, for the MD of Grand Prairie, for the city of Calgary. He's doing the tree inventory. He's about to get 
they're doing the process now that he's going to do tree inventory for the foothills. Like he's that's something we could look at. What is our tree value in this county? What do we have? Right. And obviously, it all comes at a cost, but this guy is is good. And at the part of, at the start of all the Zoom meetings, I do I do introduce him and talk about what he's done and kind of reiterate where we've been with our topics and where we're going. And that might be a short little blurb to put out on the, the on social media then for you to do that. You know, spotlight with Quentin and Egg Service Board is putting this on, and here's where this is who we have. Like, it's it's a big thing. Like, I, it's a big thing. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too for greater awareness. Like, so for the past workshops that are already aired, where do you on the county's web page? Where does that come up? Where can you click to get them right off the web page, or do you have to hunt somewhere else? Basically. They're on our YouTube channel. Yeah, they show YouTube channel. channel. So I think you directed there from the county book. Okay. Yeah, right at the bottom of our website is our YouTube link. Oh, yeah. Right down there. So you click that and uh, you'll see today's meeting. All the, the tree workshops are there. Would they? Pardon me? They wouldn't know that the tree shop workshops, that the tree workshops are there. So we should. We're enough. The calendar takes you there as well. Just the calendar? Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, on Facebook, Nikki has that. Because okay. I was just taking the awareness piece. Maybe, maybe she, information. Yeah, maybe she could put on there, you know, if you missed it, you know, go to our YouTube page. And you well, can. and even yeah. Quentin, like I said, Quentin could do a little blurb and show people how to get there too, plus uh, and a little deal. I just. I was just thinking, even a little line or a little Jay. box where it says tree workshops um, yeah. on the every two or whatever every those tuesdays and go to the youtube channel below or whatever and then, then this comes up under um this is under our calendar is the calendar. oh yeah when you hit the calendar okay just i was just saying we're pretty greater awareness because Quentin was saying there's only maybe 20 some people watching as they go on but it, it's oh, good it's always later and i know later and then one o'clock i know it's as long as they're being caught that's the important part because it's good information and I myself want to see them. So oh, I, 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 like I said, I'll be binge watching. Okay, no, that's good. Anything further? There's no other reminder. We've got regional conference coming up this fall. I can't remember the day. However, now's the time to start making resolutions. Anything you want to put forward to the province or the federal government about agriculture? Now's the time to start. Here's a thought because I gotta get the background information done, gotta get things set. So now is the time to start talking about it. So that needs to be set for our September meeting. So we need wheels. a resolution on this. Okay, wheels training on resolution set too. And if you think all is great in the county, province, and country, then great, let's ride the boat. Sure, you can think of something that needs a tweaking. <laughs> You're right there too, though. Okay, uh, Wayne? Uh, on that topic, the, uh, the ASP Provincial Committee is going to be a little bit more critical about uh, resolutions that's come forward this year because there was quite a few complaints last year about some of the resolutions. So, uh, are you on the resolution committee? Well, by being on there, I am. Uh, there's only five really directors in the province, so we're all on the resolution committee. So, uh, yeah, just uh, it's going to be more important to have your resolution done properly than than it has been in the past. You know, so, so if if I would make one suggestion, and I I tell you, so I I am on the resolution committee for action. Won't be on. I won't be on. Yeah, no. But if you could bring that to them, so. One of the things that we were we were we went we struggled with a very similar situation yeah, you, you mentioned that. and so we have before the resolutions got there we send out a, a resolution report card so so basically last year we advocated for more money towards um, that the provincial government reinstate some of the kind of funding cuts to the to agricultural um the um what is the call center here in Stepford, right? So that report card was put out before you started getting resolutions because 
Unfortunately, members have a short memory from one year to the next and you get new members, but if that report card goes out and it says, okay, this was the resolution, so in the last three years, this is where we're at, this is where we're at, this is where we're at, you know, we're almost one on this one, we've done this one, that one. And we do that report card, but that has to get out to the people beforehand so that there isn't the repeat of very similar resolutions. And this is done with the actual report the resolutions. So those resolutions, the report card has is, is been out and it's been modified already. And so when but, but it should go out to all the anchor reports so again. So we can they do. for the next meeting, I can put in the report card again. And we can have it there because I just brought it up. Um, we're in Bashaw, November 3. And it's been revised to the, yeah. the uh, report card as well. So we need to get resolutions to the regional secretary by October 6. So when we have our September uh 22nd meeting i got i got 12 days <laughs> to create grab background tweak have four people on who look at it and make it look smart and get it to them right? <laughs> okay so basically the timeline is never really good so basically what we have right so this board should we're thinking Get a GM the group email out there with all the board members, including myself. Let's get some thought process going so that we can at least have something, a little snowball made for the September 22 meeting that we can build on. Or if I so miss the ball, starting, we be on what you're after. We've got one meeting. Exactly. Yeah, so you're not starting from scratch on September 22nd. One of the discussions we also had was about a parliamentarian, just because of some of the things that went on last year that people were complaining about. Yeah. Not happy about. So it comes at an extra charge, but so that that would be something that will be taken to the uh, conference, provincial conference, to see what the, the SB think about it. You know, you, you know, with the other, with the details, with the extra costs, and and maybe the good or not that we'll get out of it. We got, a, we got a good parliamentarian. Yeah. No, that's important. <laughs> we have some unbears. Yeah, that's very important. Okay, no, I think we've discussed that. Give you the motion. That's what I'm looking for. To adjourn. That's it. Hey, James has made the motion. All in favor? Carried.